All right, I think we should probably go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds, um, this post Thanksgiving Tuesday. Um, just as a reminder, next week there will not be um, uh, Grand Rounds um, uh, due to a leadership retreat. And so Grand Rounds will resume for the two following weeks um, before the holidays um, with two actually fantastic presentations. So don't tune out for the rest of the year, It's but just no Grand Rounds next week. So um, I am delighted that every year the Department of Hospital Medicine volunteers to do two CPCs um, for our Grand Round series. And so this is the first for this academic year. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shen Chen. All right. In fact, it's um, uh, Dr. Musa and Dr. Shen at the same uh, uh, location. Uh, um, uh, I am with the Dr. Uh, Kenan Clark. Uh, we lead the Emory Division Hospital Medicine uh, CPC, and um, we were just joking about like we had recent CPC for the resident uh, recently. So we are looking forward, excitement about uh, presenting an interesting case. We do have um, uh, two esteemed uh, uh, consultant on board to discuss the the case, and we have uh, as well two of our hospitalists who will be presenting. Uh, the case we do have. Uh, I'll start with the introduction. Introducing the first uh, hospital is Dr. Jason Lucas. Uh, he um, uh, completed his medical school at uh, Temple University and his residency at the University of Southern uh, California. Um, he finished the MPH uh, uh, program from the Boston uh, University, and he has been a hospitalist at Emory since 2015. Currently, assistant professor. Uh, as well will be later on uh, during the presentation will be Dr. Haila Kalev, who is going to be uh, revealing the diagnosis for us uh, after the discussion, Dr. Uh, Shen. And Dr. Haila uh, Kalev uh, is an assistant professor in the Division of Hospital Medicine and a hospitalist at Emory University Hospital. She completed residency at Beth uh, uh, Israel Dickens uh, Medical Center and developed passion into uh, um, education and currently serve as the site director for the Medi medicine of, uh, clerkship at Emory uh, uh, University Hospital. And without further ado, I will uh, pass the baton to um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lucas, who is gonna be introducing the case, and, uh, will be, and he will be introducing our uh, discussion, Dr. Shen. Dr. Lucas? Yes, thank you. Um, so we'll start off, I wanna thank, first of all, I'll start off by thanking everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna start off with um, just going through the case um, of this patient that we're gonna discuss. So we will get to it. So um, our patient is a 72 year old man, uh, history of di type two diabetes hypertension who presented um, with fevers, um, a pustular rash, as well as diffuse arthralgias. Um, he had these um, uh, symptoms for several years and had seen multiple specialists regarding them. So I'm gonna take you through the history kind of um, back of you know years to when it's they started and kind of go to the come from the past to the present um as far as his symptom uh symptoms so um initially he, these symptoms we, we just we just lost um the slides sorry. we're seeing a teams link yeah sorry it looks like someone else is screen sharing right now Okay, try again. You see our screen now? Yes, perfect. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, it's okay. So um, about four to six years ago, the patient started having these diffuse kind of arthralgias um, and stiffness um, in his wrists, ankles, knees, and PIP joints. Uh, he was evaluated um, in the rheumatology clinic. Um, uh, the, the rheumatoid factor was positive. The CCP was negative. He had some uh, mild to moderately elevated um, inflammatory markers. So he, uh, it was kind of, uh, he began treatment or receiving treatment for a uh, presumed diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, although he did not have all the classic, you know, findings for that. Started treatment with prednisone and methotrexate did not really respond to that. Um, uh, and then he was um, added onto uh, a Tanercept, um, which was transitioned to adalimumab. Um, and so, these, this regimen started improving his symptoms, but uh, it was noticed that he was unable to, once his, the prednisone was weaned down and, and really below 10 millimolar, 
was he was uh, he began began flaring again, and the symptoms kind of um, became worse. And then about two years ago, he developed this diffuse pruritic rash um, with uh, yellowish plaques over his abdomen and flank chest, um, arms, uh, forearms, and medial thigh, as well as some violaceous plaques. Um, and he was seen by dermatology. They thought it might be related to, um, you know, as far as a reaction to the uterinocept, that was discontinued. And then the rash seemed to improve, um, but only after their uh, prednisone was increased. And then in the past year, about nine months ago, he developed a sudden onset hearing loss in his right ear. Um, an MRI of his brain did not show any lesions or any kind of explanation for this hearing loss. Um, he was treated with high dose steroids, but um, it did not improve his hearing. Um, and then he began developing um, fatigue, unintended weight loss, and you know persistent fevers. Um, and then some uh, of us began also developing some tender, thickened uh, subcutaneous nodules on his upper arms and wrists. Um, and then the um, you know the the rash with the pruritic and uh, um, painful um, painful and pruritic rash began uh, returning as well. And then the past few months, about three months ago, he um, he was having some worsening of his diffuse arthralgias and joint pains um, that were treated with uh, IV steroids. Um, and then about two months ago, he did develop an acute uh, foot drop, thought to be related to uh, potentially a mononeuritis multiplex. Um, and that was treated with high dose steroids, but it did not improve. Um, some workup for that, serial nerve biopsy was normal. And then um, there were some, uh, that, that another biopsy was just really showed some mild neurogenic changes, um, but nothing that was really, um, you know, revealing at all. And then about a month ago, um, he was actually admitted with um, with shock requiring pressors um, that, uh, you know, with an infection workup that was uh, unremarkable. and. It just it, the suspected cause of that was just a diffuse, you know, um, generalized inflammatory process, and he did recover with high dose steroids. And so now the current admission uh, for this patient, um, beginning to or still having persistent fevers, um, postural rash um, had also worsened as well as his uh, um, arthralgias, and then he did have some subendipolar lymphadenopathy the last few days prior to admission, um, and then he had been. During this time, had begun treatment with rituximab and prednisone. Um, prednisone was about 30 twice a day, and as it decreased to 20 twice a day, and then um, right before admission. And uh, so he, he came in for reevaluation. Um, the rash was pretty diffuse over his back, legs, forehead, um, chest, uh, and arms. Um, and then he also began developing pustules of those uh, lesions. Um, and he was he was having persistent fevers during the inpatient stay. Um, as well, um, and he was also reporting, you know, malaise fatigue, decreased appetite, and then the diffuse joint pain. Um, and then you can see um, through systems, he denied any vertigo, tinnitus, headache, vision changes, recent travel, all those other findings. So his past medical history, uh, high blood pressure, uh, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, AFib, uh, provoked GVT, um, foot drop, and then MGUS. No past surgical history. Uh, social history, he lives with his wife, he's a retired school teacher, and no alcohol, tobacco, or drugs. Family history, mother with hypertension, father with diabetes, and sister with uh, had an unknown cancer of unknown uh, origin. Um, and then no uh, allergies. His medications, as you can see, prednisone 20 twice a day, uh, eloquis, um, atorvastatin, calcium, and the rest of them you can see. Um, so let's move on a little bit to the exam. So on exam, um, he wasn't currently febrile. His other vital signs were pretty uh, unremarkable. As far as for his exam, um, the um, significant findings, he had some bilateral anterior cervical and uh, left subandibular lymphadenopathy. He had some tenderness of his uh, both joints and PIP um, wrists and both PIP joints, um, but no swelling or edema. And then his skin was notable for this red to pink uh, uh, pustular um, and papular rash with uh, some areas where there, where there were plaques. And this was along his um, extensor forearms, uh, uh, chest, back. Um, and that's, yeah, I'm actually gonna show you a picture of those. These are the pictures of his rash. And then we'll go on to some labs. The significant findings for these were, he had a pancytopenia, as you can see, um, other than that, um, he did a little bit initially have an elevated creatinine, but that quickly normalized with fluid. 
other than that, um, this lab's fairly unremarkable. Um, uh, and so we did an SPAP, UPAP. The, um, the SPAP really was actually significant for um, an IgA cap repair protein. The UPAP was negative. Additional workup. So we did some pretty um, extensive autoimmune workup. It, as you can see, the primary um, significant findings were an ANA was positive of 1 to 160, um, and it was speckled in AMA pattern. Other than that, um, you know, a couple other positives were greater to microglobulin at IgG and IgM levels were low. And next for that, there we did also an infectious, pretty extensive infectious workup. Um, as you can see, most uh, most things were negative, aside from just an EBV viral load and IgG were positive. As far as imaging, MRI brain, uh, CT chest out and pelvis and echocardiogram were done. Also, well, those were fairly unremarkable. And then we did a bone marrow biopsy, which actually did show evidence of a plasma cell neoplasm. Um, and then flow cytometry of the bone marrow and the full blood um, were done. Um, uh, the flow cytometry of the bone marrow did actually show evidence of a plasma cell neoplasm. Um, but the, um, the peripheral blood uh, flow cytometry was unremarkable. It did not show any abnormal um, cell populations, hematocytal avoid cell populations. And then biopsy of the skin lesions were also done. Really didn't show anything too remarkable. Um, the dermatophyte broma of his shoulder, really just some inflammatory infiltrates and um, really just nonspecific findings. And then um, his left thigh was just some urtic area. So case summary, 72-year-old man, history of diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, with uh, multiple years of joint pain, um, diffuse joint pain, stiffness, response with the steroids, um, and also with this history of MGUS, and now having some pancytopenia and recent acute hearing loss, foot drop, and these persistent fevers, as well as the worsening of this diffuse pustular erythematous rash, and lymphadenopathy, um, you know, just presenting for worsening these symptoms um, uh, that had been, become increasingly refractory to steroids. Okay, now I'd like to introduce our next, uh, this, or our discussant, Dr. Shen Chen. She will, um, she's uh, actually a hospitalist at uh, Emory's Johns Creek since 2017. She graduated from the Medical College of Georgia, um, and she's also the Assistant Director of Education at Emory Johns Creek. Dr. Chen. Thank you, Jason. I'm gonna try to share my screen now. All right, so can you convert it to um yeah? Can you guys see me better? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we'll just talk a little bit more about the case. Um, before I start, I'm going to kind of go over the objective of my discussion. We'll try to develop a broad differential base on the clinical case. We'll try to narrow down our differential base on the clinical data available. And then we'll try to review a few disease criteria. Um, if everyone can help me register, um, there is a poll. Um, the the uh, link is down here, um, or you can text to 22333, and then um, can uh, sign up for the link. So, so going over the HPI, uh, we have a 72-year-old male, uh, past medical history, diabetes, hypertension, a uh, patient that looks like also has a DVT and MGUS, also with AFib. A uh, person with joint pain, rash, fatigue, fever for more than a year. Um, looks like a patient has quite a significant history for the past couple of years with issues. Um, looks like the joint pain is diffuse, involving both wrist, knee, ankle, and um, as well as the rash has been pruritic, mildly painful, in the abdomen, kind of progressing to the chest and extremities and patient has neurological findings such as hearing loss and foot drop and has been going on for at least for a couple of months. So on the right is kind of the summary of uh, what we have learned so far. Um, kind of looking back to the review system, uh, the review system is pretty benign, really no uh, new medication, recent travel, recent infection, no weight loss or nice sweat kind of B symptoms, and uh, really no 
cardiovascular abdominal symptoms as well, or respiratory symptoms. Family history, um, hypertension, diabetes, and cancer. Uh, social history, um, really mainly just former smoker, currently not smoking anymore. Um, so home medication, just reviewing the home medication. Uh, so a couple of things to look at, uh, patient is on Bactrim uh, and patient also has still been on steroids. So patient is still on 30 of steroids at this time. So a pretty decent dose at this point. Let's look at physical exam, see what is significant. So really a patient has no oral ulcers or thrush. Um, patient does have uh, lymphadenopathy noted bilaterally. Um, currently for the cardiovascular, pulmonary, abdominal are pretty non-significant, no mention of hepatosplenomegaly. Um, and for muscle, we notice patient has tenderness in the wrist and the PIP joint, so both involving the distal joint, um, and there's no swelling or erythema. For skin, uh, we notice plaques in abdomen and the chest with some uh, malicious discoloration in the extremities. Uh, neurologically, there's nothing significantly mentioned. Um, so here is the poll again. If you're interested, here's the QR code as well. What do you think the differential at this time is? Um, see. Oh, great. So we have lymphoma, connective tissue disease, Sarcoid, myeloma, vexes, scleroderma, vasculitis, perineal plastic, Kaposi, lymphoma. Okay, myeloma. Great. The sheds, sarcoid. So it sounds like the big three we're seeing is connective tissue disease, lymphoma, myeloma at this point. So let's go to the next slide. So, uh, so let's kind of review what we have know so far. So we know that the patient has a rash uh, in the truncal extremities. There seems like there's no oral involvement. Uh, the joint is mostly distal, looks like, PIP and the wrist with no swelling redness at this time. There's lymphadenopathy, fever, greater than a urine, hearing loss, and foot drop. So there seems like there's systemic involvement at this point. There's some also hematological involvement with patients' history of MGUS, DVT, uh, some cardiac involvement, and uh, endocrine involvement at this point. So I agree with you that the differential at this point can be pretty broad, um, just kind of looking at the big classes. Um, so we're thinking uh, kind of infectious etiology, something more of latent, uh, definitely uh, with viral, bacterial, fungal, parasitic. Uh, there could be some rheumatological disease with vasculitis, pictures, uh, definitely a connect tissue disease, definitely still on our differential. Um, there may be some IBD. Uh, immunodeficiency. There's definitely hematological causes, like some kind of tumor, uh, perineal plastic syndrome, or uh, some kind of uh, hematological tumor like lymphoma, multiple myeloma, um, HLH. Um, there's some idiopathic symptoms like uh, reactive adult cell disease. Um, there's maybe some genetic disorder that can cause it. Um, and sometimes certain drugs can cause it, although with patients, long history, less likely. And then there could be some neurological thing that can have overlapping like multiple sclerosis. So at this point, based on what we have so far, we can probably eliminate quite a bit of uh, uh, drugs just because patient hasn't been on these drugs. Um, and then we can eliminate, likely patient doesn't have the typical uh, tick-borne illness rash um, and with the history, not exposure, it doesn't seem like a tick illness. With vasculitis, we can probably rule out Bachette's at this point um, with no oral involvement. There's no mention of oral involvement. Um, we can probably make PMR with not mentioning of any uh, proximal muscle rather than, and then with the 
skirt through month, I expect some thermal findings uh, in the skin, in the hands and stuff, which really there's no mention of that. Um, and there's really no abdominal symptom mentioned in the history. Um, and with sarcoids, less likely with there's no lung, and this is not a typical sarcoid uh, rash that we see. So um, let's look at the general lab and see what we can find based on the general labs. So a patient has kind of a mild hyponatremia with uh, kind of a mild metabolic acidosis. A uh, patient does have an AKI, uh, looks like it's a pre-renal AKI because uh, it did improve significantly quickly with fluid, uh, a little bit high hyperglycemia, which will uh, go with patient's history of diabetes. Triglycerides are only mildly elevated, and a patient does have, looks like, uh, uh, hypoalbuminemia uh, with quite an elevation in ferritin of uh, 974. Uh, with the basic CBC, we see patient does have uh, looks like pancytopenia. So there's looks like some kind of a bone marrow suppression going on for the patient. Um, so at this point with that, uh, typically we will see much uh, higher numbers with uh, leukemia. I guess for lymphoma, with I guess we will, uh, I guess we can keep lymphoma on board at this point, uh, but with numbers less likely at this point. So next one, we can look at the infectious disease lab. Uh, so they did a pretty extensive infectious disease workup. Uh, the only thing that was really significant looks like is a patient does have prior EBV infection. So could this be related from a prior infection causing something new happening? So with that, we can rule out quite a bit of the infectious disease uh, ideologies. Uh, and then one significant to notice, uh, CRP is negative. So quite a bit of reactive things like reactive arthritis, giant cell, probably will be negative at this point. Um, so looking at the rheumatological lab at this point, um, CD, C3, C4 are quite normal. Um, and patients are also on steroids at this point. Um, with still having these symptoms, her, um, oh, sorry, his uh, rheumatoid factor initially was positive, uh, but the VP looks like it is negative. Um, so with that, we can probably eliminate quite a bit of diseases. Um, the only thing I do want to keep uh, at, at this point is rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, with that, sometimes could, could it be that patient is developing into a uh, steroid resistant at this point? Um, so let's keep going and move forward with uh, the hematological labs at this point. So a couple of things we notice is a uh, patient does have IgG and IgM deficiency. A uh, patient does have, looks like a uh, bone marrow suppression with a monoclonal gonopathy at this point. There is, a uh, looks like mild decreased beta globulin and uh, with hypoglobinemia, uh, patient's copper level is low. Uh, CRP is negative, and uh, the peripheral uh, blood didn't really have any uh, abnormal cells, but uh, the plasma cell is at 5%, which kind of uh, goes with the history of the MCUS for this patient. So with that, we can probably eliminate multiple myeloma based on the uh, bone marrow. So let's look at the images. So uh, in images are pretty benign. Uh, really, the couple of things keep in mind, there's no mention of hepatospinomegaly, and there's no, looks like cardiac or uh, lung cardiology. Uh, bring MRI also was negative at this point. So um, likely, if we will probably uh, catch solid tumor if it, it was in the skin, um, and then uh, with the, the whole clinical picture, less likely probably have multiple sclerosis at this point. Uh, so let's look at the skin biopsy at this point. Um, so uh, uh, just to summarize, so patient doesn't have any amyloid deposit. Uh, there is, uh, looks like a perivascular infiltrate, which may be vasculitis, maybe a little urticaria, and then uh, some nodules with dermatofibromas at this point. So um, with that, 
not typical rash we see with psoriasis, RA with someone with the, the history the patient has, probably not uh, just because of the, just with the our, our RA treatment for years really not, not significantly improved. It, it's very atypical if it's RA at this point. We can probably eliminate amyloid disease at this point. And the, the timeline for Bactrim doesn't match just because I think the patient just started Bactrim and it, it hasn't been going on. And I expect if this is Bactrim, um, then it would just have set, suddenly start rather than having going on for years. Um, so um, based on this, uh, what do you guys think? Um, if you want to join, this is the poll. Let's see if any diagnosis has changed a little bit. Let me actually clear the screen one more time. Uh, oops. Oh. Actually, let me try to see if I can clear the screen a little bit. No. Oh. Oh. No. I'm so sorry. Uh, let me see if... Um, Okay, that's fine. We'll just. So uh, HLH. Um, and then. Uh, so I see new things, SWE syndrome. Uh, Stephylis, sclerosis, uh, MDS, CVID. All right. So let's move on. All right. So I guess to summarize kind of what we have learned with all the findings we found. So patient has rash in the abdomen extremities, no oral involvement distal uh, joint involvement, pain, the wrist PIP, but no swelling or redness. Patient has lymphopathy, fever for more than a year, hearing loss, foot drop. Patient does have a Q renal injury, whether this is just pre-renal or something more. Uh, patient has pancytopenia, hypoalbuminemia. Uh, the rashes are papular, urticaria, derma fibroma with maybe perivascular vascular involvement, bones, more of a distal joint pain with negative uh, inflammatory markers, uh, nerves, there's hearing and foot drop. Hematologically, patient has pancytopenia, pancytopenia bone marrow suppression, low IgG and M. Uh, patient does have a little bit of renal involvement. Hematological patient is hypercoagulable with DVTs and then with MGUS. And then uh, patient does have, looks like previous EBV infection. So whether this could be a recent infection. So, uh, and this is kind of summary of all the uh, nerve. So just kind of looking at the couple of diseases uh, that still are on the board, uh, let's look at uh, adult stills disease. So just in, uh, in order to diagnose adult stills disease, there's five or more criteria that are required. Uh, two are, have to be major. Um, so looking at this patient has, looks like fever for, uh, 39 for last period of a week. Patient does have arthralgia and arthritis. Patient does not have the typical salmon color rash. Um, the patient does not have the leukocytosis. Uh, so patient does meet two of the criteria. For my criteria, there's no mention of sore throat. Uh, patient does have lymphadenopathy. There's no mention of hepatomegaly or spinomegaly. And patient's liver function is normal. Um, and then the patient does have a negative test for uh, anti-nuclear antibodies, uh, and the rheumatoid factor at this point is negative. But uh, we'll keep this at, in mind at this point, uh, since patient uh, is, but still, let's go to the next disease process we can look up. So looking up SWE syndrome, um, you have to have two of the major criteria, and then at least two of the minor criteria. 
for the major criteria, patients have to have sudden onset interruption of tender or painful plaques or nodules. A uh, patient will have neutrophilic infiltrate in the dermis without vasculitis, although I the, the patient's uh, biopsy does suggest more of a lymphocytic infiltrates. So, um, but we'll keep that in mind. Patient does have fevers. Patient does have the EBV infection prior to this. Uh, patient does not have elevated white count or uh, with a neutral for predominance. Patient does not have inflammatory markers. Um, and patient really hasn't fully responded to the cortical steroids. So, um, so we'll keep sweet syndrome in mind as well. The next uh, disease we will talk about is HLH. Uh, so you have to have five out of eight criteria uh, to diagnose with HLH. Uh, patient has to have fevers, which he does. There's no mention of splenomegaly. Patient does have cytopenia. Patient does have triglyceridemia, although it's very mild than the, the one for HLH. Um, we, there's no mention of phagocytosis uh, in the biopsies. We don't know what the level of the natural killer cell is at this point. Um, ferritin is definitely above uh, 500, and uh, we actually do not have the interleukin levels at this point, and we are not sure about the mutations. There's no mention of that. So we can also keep this in mind as well. Um, and then uh, the next syndrome, which is a pretty new syndrome called Vexus syndrome, it's vacuol E1 X link auto inflammatory somatic uh, syndrome. Um, so it's a mutation in the EBA1 gene. Um, it's derived from the uh, battle uh, poetic progenitor cells. It's uh, involving inflammatory and hematological symptoms, which we see with our patients. Um, and then there is some. A uh, patient will have kind of a whole body involvement, include neurological involvement, like hearing loss, connective tissue involvement, like inflammatory arthritis. Uh, there is bone marrow suppression, as we see with our patients. Um, typically, these patients also will have hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, and colitis, which was not mentioned in our patients. Patient will also have fevers, uh, cutaneous vasculitis and patient will uh, more likely to develop a DVT. So this also kind of will keep this diagnosis in mind as well. And then um, one other disease uh, that could also sound um, is part of the CVID family. Uh, it's called ATP6AP1. Um, and so it's also X-linked of ATP6AP1 deficiency, also known as uh, this. I'm not going to try to push it up. Um, so it's an immunodeficiency. Typically, we'll have liver involvement, uh, which was not mentioned in our patient. Um, this patient will also have neurological involvement, connective tissue involvement. They also will have glomerular or tubular dysfunction with uh, sensory neural hearing loss. Um, they also will have some uh, pancreatic insufficiency, which is not mentioned in our patient. Um, so at this point with that, uh, our differential is still pretty wide, uh, more testing may need to be done, uh, but uh, we'll have uh, Ms., uh, Dr. Caleb um, to further uh, discuss the diagnosis. Here's my reference. Uh, let me stop sharing. Okay. Can everyone see these slides? Yes. Um, so this patient was evaluated in conjunction with the dermatology, hematology, and rheumatology services. His bone marrow biopsy was re-reviewed showing intracytoplasmic vacuoles within myeloid precursor cells, which raised suspicion for Bex syndrome. And then genetic testing revealed a mutation in codon 41 of the UBA1 gene, which was further supportive of this diagnosis. So Dr. Chen, um, thank you for that great discussion. And you actually uh, already discussed a little bit of this syndrome. But, um, you know, VEXA syndrome, the name is an acronym which is comprised of some of the key features of the disease. Um, but yes, this is a new um, 
uh, newly described syndrome from 2020 that was initially described in a series of 25 men who had adult onset severe autoinflammatory and hemo hematologic abnormalities. Um, and uh, genomic studies at that point revealed this sort of common novel somatic mutation in the X-linked UBA1 gene, which encodes that E1 enzyme, um, which is responsible for ubiquitin activating, uh, uh, the, it codes the ubiquitin activating enzyme. Um, so the result is a severe progressive autoinflammation that can affect numerous organ systems, as you guys can see in this figure on the right here. And I've highlighted um, some of the uh, clinical features that this patient shared. But as you can see, it, it can affect essentially uh, every organ system in some way. Um, and so next, we're going to turn to Dr. Waltuck from the Department of Rheumatology, who's going to take us through his approach to this patient's severe autoinflammatory disease. So um, I'm going to stop my screen share to give you time to get your slides up. But by way of introduction, um, so Dr. Waltuck was born and raised in New York City. He completed his undergraduate training at upstate, uh, in upstate New York and medical school at SUNY Downstate. He was a resident, a chief resident at St. Luke's Hospital in Manhattan and completed rheumatology fellowship at NYU. He spent the last 30 years on the faculty at Emory, the Emory School of Medicine and is an associate professor. He's been named a master clinician. And just this summer, he had two very cool tattoos placed. So Dr. Waltuck, I'll let you take over and you can tell us more about those tattoos if you'd like. OK, thank you very much. Uh... Am I sharing the screen? You are. Okay. All right. First of all, I got to give my props to Drs. Chen and Califf. They this was a very difficult uh, case to summarize and very daunting to come up with a differential diagnosis. I think maybe if I had had both of them involved, maybe I could have made this diagnosis a little earlier. Because certainly, I was flailing about for several years following him in the rheumatology clinic. Um, so the way I want to talk about this is uh, I want to introduce the concept that I'm sure you guys are familiar with of autoinflammatory syndromes. These are genetically based immune dysregulatory conditions which are associated with recurrent episodes of sterile systemic inflammation. In other words, there is some perturbation of the regulation of inflammation such that inflammation occurs when it shouldn't. Um, these are distinct from autoimmune diseases. This is not like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, things like that, in which there is an abnormal immune response to native antigens. Uh, when I was in training, uh, this was just barely becoming a cohesive uh, entity. Uh, certainly when I was in medical school, there, uh, the term autoinflammatory syndromes had not been coined. That name was coined by Dr. Daniel Kastner, who has been doing great work on these syndromes for 35 years at the NIH and whose name is more associated with autoinflammatory conditions than any other. Um, even when I was in training uh, in the late Pleistocene era, there was an appreciation of at least one recurrent inflammatory syndrome. And that was familial Mediterranean fever, which you're all familiar with. And you know that there are certain ethnic groups that are particularly predisposed to this, um, non-Ashkenazi Jews, Arabs, Turks, um, uh, Armenians. And it was known that this was of autosomal recessive inheritance. The specific gene, however, was not defined until the 1990s. And this gene is called MEFV also referred to as pyrin or marinestrin. And there are four common missense mutations in this gene, which lead to the syndrome of familial Mediterranean fever, but there are over a hundred total 
which makes it somewhat difficult to test for it and, and to exclude other possibilities. Um, Dr. Kastner at NIH presided over an explosion of descriptions of other auto-inflammatory syndromes beginning in the 90s, and this has continued today and will continue in the future. Some of these are mevalon A kinase deficiency, which had previously been known as the hyper-IgD syndrome, cryopyrin-associated periodic syndrome, which was previously known under a number of different names, including synchonomid, Muckle-Wells, and familial cold auto-inflammatory syndrome, deficiency of interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, or DIRA, pyogenic arthritis, pyoderma gangrenosum, and acne, or PAPA. Now, this is just a small sampling of the entities that have been described and continue to be described. And we are most certainly not at the end of these. What I think is particularly interesting about Vexus is that this is the first time that an auto-inflammatory disease has been described, which is due to a somatic mutation rather than a germline mutation. Um, Dr. David Beck was the primary driver of this, and he was very interested in a molecule called ubiquitin, which is present in all eukaryotic cells and is involved in post-translational modification of protein. Um, in other words, this is a signal uh, for uh, proteins to undergo specific processes, in particular degradation if they are misfolded. And it was known that some abnormalities in ubiquitination was associated with abnormal episodes of inflammation. The three steps of ubiquitination are activation, conjugation, and ligation. And as we said, these result in uh, changes in the function um, of the protein. Here we have Drs. Beck and Kastner. Um, they uh, were two of the triumvirate, the third one being Dr. Peter Grayson, who are most responsible for the description of Vexus. I think you can see Dr. Kastner needs to have a little trim of those eyebrows. Perhaps his wife could point that out to him. This is the original article from uh, December of 2020 um, in the New England Journal. And this slide I should mention, along with a number of the other slides that I'm going to show you, are borrowed from our outstanding second year fellow, Dr. Mavi Rivera who gave uh, a similar presentation on this topic. So this is a disease that is less than three years old. Vexus, as has been said, stands for vacuoles, E1 enzyme, X-linked, auto-inflammatory, and somatic. So a somatic mutation, this is not a germline mutation. This is not something that you are born with. This is something that occurred at some point during your life, and then these cells began to uh, divide and perhaps outcompete other cells to the point where they could have a clinical manifestation. So this is obviously something which occurs late in life. The E1 enzyme is on the X chromosome. So for that reason, you only need one copy in a male to have a clinical disease. It also occurs only in myeloid and erythroid cells. What exactly the frequency of this abnormality is, is still very much up in the air, and we'll be seeing much more about this in the future. The other thing which is unique about Vexus is that it was discovered in a sort of backward fashion. Most uh, syndromes uh, are discovered by people recognizing a specific phenotype or a set of phenotypes that are shared amongst a number of people, and then looking to see 
if there is a genotype that is associated with this. In this case, Dr. Beck was specifically interested in a ubiquitin cascade, and he looked through all of the patients with unexplained multi-system inflammatory diseases that had been cataloged at the NIH for years. And he looked specifically for this genotype abnormality, and he found a number of them. And this then led to a number of other patients being tested for this, and all of them in some way shared a phenotype, although as uh, been described already, the phenotype was pretty broad and uh, a little nonspecific. So this is the ubiquitin proteasome system. Um, there are three enzymes, activation, conjugation, and ligation, but most of the regulation takes place at the E1 enzyme because there is only one which does 90% of this. The abnormality in vexus is in that E1 enzyme. So as we said, uh, the main E1 enzyme does greater than 90% of the activation of ubiquitin. So if you, if you have a mutation in that enzyme, it's going to have a clinical manifestation, which it does. It's the same slide that was shown earlier, but point being, this is uh, a multi-system disease which can present in many different ways. Uh, chondritis ear chondritis and nasal chondritis, fairly common. This is indicative of a condition that we refer to as relapsing polychondritis. And in fact, the feeling is that someplace between five and 10% of people who we have called relapsing polychondritis, in fact, meet criteria for Vax's syndrome. Uh, pleural effusions, myocarditis, colitis, uh, neutrophilic dermatosis, vasculitis, which this patient had, Blood clots, which this patient had, is definitely a major um, manifestation of this disease. Exactly how common these mutations are is up in the air, but is I would expect to see a number of articles in the future um, which will better define this. Um, the first ones, one of the first ones was done with the Geisinger cohort in Pennsylvania, um, which has particular ethnic background, 94% European, 62% female. They found that about one out of every 14,000 patients had this genetic abnormality. And of patients in the right age range, like men over the age of 50, it was about one in 4,000. So this is not a uh, unheard of, it's not extraordinarily rare. It has um, an incidence somewhat comparable to some of our other rheumatologic conditions. Now, there are three main mutations which take place in this UB1 enzyme, and they are not all the same. The prognosis and manifestations vary somewhat depending on which the mutation is. And you can see here in particular, the uh, 41 codon methionine to valine mutation is associated with extraordinarily bad prognosis. Overall, I think it's important to realize that this is not a good prognostic condition. It's very difficult to treat. Um, it requires high doses of steroids to even control the inflammation, and then you have all of the associated toxicity with that. Um, we don't have great treatments for this. I'm going to leave to Dr. Langston some, um, some more on uh, the treatment. Um, uh, we do have one analogy in rheumatology, which we think about sometimes, and that is Erdheim-Chester disease which is also due to a somatic mutation of myeloid progenitor cells, specifically in the BRAF gene. And this leads to a rare multi-system disease of adulthood with excess histiocytes and a number of different manifestations, including pulmonary fibrosis, et cetera, et cetera. So the point being, somatic mutations can cause disease. Now, 
Dr. Langston and the, rheumato and, the derma and the hematologists know very well about this because they have a whole bunch of diseases. But for rheumatology, this was kind of novel. We had not seen this before. I think we have to assume that this is just the tip of the iceberg and that there are going to be descriptions of a number of different somatic mutations leading to auto-inflammatory conditions in the next few years. I can tell you that I have a patient in his 50s from South Carolina who's a banker who has uh, seronegative inflammatory arthritis, neutrophilic dermatosis, and thrombocytopenia, which is very resistant to treatment. And when we made a diagnosis of vexus on this syndrome, I thought, aha, I have another one, and I tested that man, and he is negative for all of those mutations. Now, that doesn't mean that he doesn't have some genetic abnormality, perhaps somatic mutation, which underlies his condition, which just hasn't been described yet. So we can expect many more of these um, in the future, and so it's a, a fascinating field. Thank you, Dr. Waltuck. And I'm going to introduce our second uh, expert, Dr. Amelia Langston. Uh, she is a professor and the executive vice chair of the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology and is director of the Emory Bone Marrow and Stem Cell Transplant Program. Uh, her clinical research interests focus on improving the safety and efficacy of transplant and cell therapy approaches for management of hematologic malignancies. We will let you take the uh, stage here. You're on mute, Amy. I'm. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay. Well, I'm going to try to wrap things up, uh, giving kind of the hematologist perspective on what is clearly a, a quite a multi-system disease, as you've already heard. So, vexus is by definition a clonal hemat hematologic disorder. It's caused, as we've talked about, by an acquired mutation in the gene UBA1 specifically in the hematopoietic stem cell compartment, unlike some of our other hematopoietic uh, um, uh, clonal diseases, the mutation is manifest really in mature myeloid, monocytic, and erythroid cells, which are mutation positive. But although the lymphoid progenitors are positive for the mutation, they essentially undergo lineage-specific apoptosis of the mutant cells via aberrant uh, protein folding. Uh, so the mature lymphoid cells are actually mutation negative. So the inflammatory component of this is really, uh, is really uh, manifest on the basis of the uh, activation of the myeloid and monocytic uh, series. Now, the hematologic manifestations of vexus are really, can be many. Macrocytic anemia is almost universal in these patients. Thrombocytopenia and sometimes leukopenia can also uh, occur. Um, we, can, we also have uh, many patients with defined hematologic disorders. We can have clonal cytopenias of undetermined significance, which is sort of the bare minimum here, because again, all of these patients are cytopenic. Uh, a substantial fracture of these patients develop MDS, and we'll talk about kind of how that potentially occurs. Plasma cell disorders, uh, most commonly MGUS, but also occasionally myeloma, uh, can occur in these patients. And that's a situation that we still don't have a, a handle on because the plasma cells themselves, which are derived from the lymphoid series are not mutation positive, but we do know that pla the development of plasma cell disorders is associated some, in many cases with tonic antigenic stimulation. So that's kind of the current hypothesis. And then we've also already heard about thrombosis, but in both venous and arterial clots can occur in these patients 
And although we don't have great numbers in terms of the frequency of these different things, because this is a syndrome in which only about 500 patients uh, are reported in the literature thus far. So we don't have great epidemiologic data, but the but my reading of the literature is that probably at least half of these patients with Vexus have had uh, uh, one or more uh, blood clots. Now, what are my clues that it might be Vexus? And I'll, I'll just say that I've got four Vexus patients in my clinic uh, right now, uh, I, including one who was part of that original New England Journal cohort, and we couldn't figure out what was going on with him, and he ended up going to the undiagnosed disease clinic at the NIH, and that's where they figured it out. But obviously, uh, because this is an X-linked disease, uh, the first clue is the patient is a man, although there has been at least one woman who, with Vexus who's been described in the literature, and she was a woman who had a single X chromosome. Uh, macrocytic anemia is almost universal. And then you have the finding of these characteristic vacuoles in the myeloid and erythroid series as shown in the uh, illustration. And then the big clue for me is the patient always has other things that are going on that are not explained by the hematologic findings. Usually they've seen multiple other specialists. Now, in my certainly in my limited experience, the severity of the inflammatory component of the syndrome is really variable. Um, I have patients, this is the, the gentleman that we talked about today is certainly my sickest Vexus patient, but most patients with Vexus, by the time they get to the hematologist, they're going to have had trials of systemic steroids, and many will be steroid uh, dependent. Now, making the diagnosis right now at Emory, we have to send blood for mutation analysis, which uh, is a send out. Uh, but UBA1 is just about to be added to our myeloid mutation panel. And what this is, means is that right now we have to think about it in order to diagnose us. But very soon, I would predict we're going to start discovering people uh, in the course of routine hematologic evaluation when they come in to be seen for cytopenias. Now, as Dr. Waltick already talked about, Vexus is rare, but it may not be as rare as we think. And, and the population-based data that he talked about suggested that the prevalence among men over the age of 50 is about one in 4,000. So that's really not that rare. Now, I want to just get into the hematologic weeds for a minute and talk about Vexus as a clonal hematopoietic disorder. And we've known for uh, some time that clonal hematopoiesis is seen in normal people. It becomes more common as we age. And the health outcomes of these patients, um, uh, as I'll show you in a minute, are, uh, are much worse than the general population. But suffice to say that mutations in commonly associated, common myeloid associated genes are seen in about 10% of, of, of unselected people over the age of 65. And we know that mutations um, are associated with a decrement in survival, not all of which is attributable to blood cancers. There is also an excess of cardiovascular deaths, and the connection there is really one with inflammation. We know that clonal hematopoiesis and inflammation can create an autocrine loop, and I think that Vexus and the UBA1 mutation is a special and kind of extreme supercharged case of this in which the clonal hematopoietic cells uh, uh, result in abnormal function leading to inflammation, which again drives an autocrine loop that only increases the, the proportion of cells with, uh, expressing clonal hematopoiesis and increases the inflammation uh, uh, in the patient. Now, the clonal landscape of Vexus really sort of supports this. In, the UB, in, in addition to UBA1, mutations in the more typical genes associated with clonal hematopoiesis occur in about 60% of Vexus patients. And there are kind of two general patterns. One is that the, the typical mutations precede the UBA1 
uh, mutation in the other, the UBA1 mutation precedes the clonal hematopoiesis mutations. And the dominant clonal hematopoiesis mutations that we see are DNMT3A and TET2 variants, uh, which are predominant mutations in our relatively asymptomatic patients. Interestingly, more sinister mutations like p53 are really very rare uh, in vexus patients. But what we think goes on here is that clonal evolution over time in the context of this autocrine loop of inflammation leads to the development of frank MDS. But because it is an inflammatory driven process, progression to AML is actually really quite rare. Now treatment, um, and again, I'm not gonna belabor this point because we don't have great treatments here. Uh, beyond corticosteroids, the, probably the most commonly used agents are the JAK inhibitors and ruxolitinib is the most common JAK inhibitor used. There are some data from, again, a small series because we don't have big data here, but rux may be more effective than the other uh, JAK inhibitors. But the use of JAK inhibitors is certainly limited by the fact that as a class, they are myelosuppressive. IL, the IL-6 pathway is also upregulated in um, these patients, and tocilizumab and anakinra have certainly been used successfully in some cases. And for patients with MDS, azacitidine has been used, and there's some um, evidence that there may be a salutary effect, not only in terms of their blood counts, but also uh, uh, in terms of the inflammatory component of things. The one treatment that is potentially curative is allogeneic transplantation. Uh, uh, obviously, only a subset of patients uh, in, in this disease will be, with this disease, will be candidates for transplantation because of age and because of how sick they are. This patient uh, is right now, uh, as of the last time that I saw him in my clinic, was still really too sick because of infectious complications and his, his general um, status. But I have transplanted three patients here at Emory, all of whom... Um, uh, are doing very well, have come off of steroids, their hematopoietic function is normal, and um, we are hopeful that they are cured. But there are only a handful of patients really in the literature that have been transplanted to date, because again, this is a very new syndrome. So take home messages here, Vexus is a pleomorphic multisystem disorder with lots of different man manifestations. Uh, from the hematologist's point of view, macrocytic anemia is almost always present, and the risk of DVT is very significant. Um, the pathophysiology really relates primarily to activation of monocytes into this inflammatory state, uh, but exactly what, what and why the defect causes this inflammatory activation is not completely understood. But we, I think about vexus in the patient that doesn't quite otherwise fit into defined inflammatory or other hematologic uh, disorders. And with that, I will stop sharing. And I think we can open things up for questions. We are unfortunately over time. Um, so I think people will actually probably start to drop off, but wow, what, um, what a fascinating presentation and our discussions that Dr. Waltuck and Langston, thank you for, um, really, um, explaining this incredibly rare disorder and then for the presentation from the rest of you guys.